Dear friends, welcome to Between Art and Record Keeping, Artistic Representations of the Holocaust. The lecture is followed by a discussion, so please post your questions in the Q&A section. Today, we celebrate the anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz-Birkenau and commemorate the six million Jewish victims of the Holocaust and millions of other victims of Nazism. The United Nations General Assembly designated this day as International Holocaust Remembrance Day. I'm Rachel Stern, Director and CEO of the Fritz Ascher Society for Persecuted, Ostracized and Banned Art based in New York. We research, discuss, publish and exhibit artists whose life and work were affected by the German Nazi regime between 1943 and 1945. I'm excited to introduce today's speaker, Ori Scholtes, teaches at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., across the disciplines of theology, art history, philosophy, and politics. He's the former director and curator of the Bnebrit Klotznik National Jewish Museum, where he curated some 80 exhibitions. He's the author of several hundred articles and catalog essays, and the author or editor of 25 books, including The Ashen Rain Bow, The Holocaust and the Arts, and Tradition and Transformation, Three Millennia of Jewish Art and Architecture. He also is the editor of a book that we just published, Immortality, Memory, Creativity and Survival, The Arts of Alice Lukahana, Ronnie Kahana and Kitra Kahana. Welcome, Ori. Thank you. It is a pleasure to be here. And let me begin by um, offering a bit of, um, how shall I put it, context. And uh, the first context question one should ask if one is discussing Holocaust art is when the Holocaust begins. Because obviously we can, in a certain sense, chart it from 1933 when Hitler becomes chancellor. And within a year or two, he has begun by way of the Nuremberg laws to limit what Jews can be and do within Germany. And we could, chart it from when the first Nuremberg Law is published. We could chart it from World War I, from when World War II begins, which is when, among other things, the conditions for Jews in Germany begin to prevail wider and wider and wider uh, across Europe, wherever the German armies uh, end up in occupation. We could chart it from 1941, when a systematic and kind of official policy of extermination has been put into place for which the previous eight years have been uh, a lead up. And there are all kinds of moments within that which stand out as significant. So we have to remember when we talk about the Holocaust that uh, its beginning point has a certain obscurity to it and its end point. Because those who survived the Holocaust as Prima Levi wrote in particular in his last book, The, Down, the Drowned and the Saved, can hardly be called survivors because of the way in which it doesn't let you go. So it, like any trauma, continues, it persists, it follows you, and it may play out not only with you, but with your children, even with your grandchildren. So it's a much larger topic than just the time frame of X to Y might appear. And it's different from World War II, not only in terms of time frame, but because the fighting of the Germans and the Italians and the Japanese by the British and the American, the French should not be confused with efforts to make the Holocaust stop or end. That leads to another question when one talks about Holocaust art, which has two parts to it. The fundamental one is when one says Holocaust art, are you talking about something that you are looking at and evaluating and judging in terms of its aesthetic value, in terms of standard traditional art historical analysis, or are you talking about historiographic documents? And the answer is sometimes one, sometimes the other, sometimes both. And at the same time, one might add that when one uses the phrase Holocaust art, one can be referring to art that was done during the Holocaust, but of course, one can talk about art done after the Holocaust right up to the present day, which offers one way or another a kind of reflection on it. As the matter of art is being shaped in Nazi Germany, virtually from the moment Hitler is really in charge, the Nazis themselves are oddly enough obsessed with art. 
they are going to determine what constitutes good art and what constitutes what they called Antarktikunst, degenerate art, art like the modernist stuff that we call cubism and that we call fauvism or we call surrealism, all of those other than naturalistic modes of reflecting on reality are for the Nazis degenerate. Obviously anything that pertains to Jews or to Roma or to Africans or to Slavs or any number of other groups that in their hierarchy of degenerates are below what they label Aryan perfection will be art that is also considered degenerate. Even a painting, let's say by Rembrandt, who is an approved artist that is called the Jewish bride will be considered degenerate because of its subject. And the Nazis became obsessed at the same time with plundering art in part because of the reason that plunderers have always wanted to plunder art, which is so they can have it, show it, and demonstrate that they're civilized and not savages. The Nazis, of course, added a layer to that process that had never been had before in terms of the vastness of the systematic manner in which they accomplished this. And oddly enough, they permitted a certain amount of cultural attainment even among the Jews whom they were first oppressing and then ultimately trying to exterminate. So there was a thing called the Kulturbund, the Kubu, which provided Jewish orchestras all over Germany with Jewish audiences. And of course, the occasional SS member of the audience to make sure that the Jewish orchestras were not playing Wagner or something that is good music, but only playing appropriately degenerate Jewish music. And these audiences who couldn't go to other concerts and these instrumentalists and performers who couldn't perform any longer in other contexts created an inner world that lasted because it served the purposes of the Nazis as propaganda that they could show the world. Not only are we not oppressing our Jews, look, they've got their own orchestras, their own audiences, we're dealing well with them. And the most signal instance of that part of the Nazi machine as it pertained to art, culture, and the Jews, of course, was creating a basis in particular in one concentration camp not far from Prague, Terezin, or in German, Theresienstadt, in which they actually permitted music, poetry, art, because A, it served their propagandistic purposes, so that when, for example, the International Red Cross visitors came to see what was going on, they could offer the pretense that they had created, that Hitler had created a wonderful city for his Jews whom he loves. And at the same time, both with respect to an entity like the Kubu and like what was happening in Terezin, it afforded an instrument, pun intended, through which the victims could feel that they weren't being victimized, be calmer and make it easier for the Nazis to proceed in what they were going to do. So if I can share my screen with you, my discussion will start not inappropriately with a work like this, which is called, um, not butterflies, it's called fireflies, excuse me. And it's a work made by an anonymous child artist at Terezin. So it turns out that as much as possible, the Terezin Jewish community tried to normalize the world of these children, which was so abnormal. And I'll demonstrate more precisely how in just a moment. There were perhaps 15,000 children under the age of 15 who came to Teretzin, and depending upon whose numbers you read, anywhere between only 100 or as many as 1,000 survived. Most of the inmates of Teretzin eventually would be moved on to Auschwitz, where they would perish in any case. And here's a second example. It's, in a sense, the, the ultimate symbol of the Teretzin children's art, because as you can see, it's butterflies. And among the most famous of the poems by, and we know his name, Pavel Friedman, that comes out of Terezin produced by children was, I never saw another butterfly. And so I kind of think of this work as a particular emblem of that. But one of the things you realize in both these two works, and there are thousands of them which survived because Friedel, who created the children's art programs, hid them in a suitcase that she buried and it was uncovered years afterwards. So thousands of these children's drawings and paintings that ultimately end up in, in Prague, in one of the synagogues where it serves as a kind of museum. What one recognizes for the most part is how if you didn't know the backstory, the context, you'd have no idea that this is by some child who is suffering enormous deprivation 
and eventually, of course, is going to perish. It is a symptom and a symbol of the resilience under these circumstances of children. But there are adults who also created art in Teretzin, and clearly the intention is a very serious one to record in some way, shape, or form what is going on. This is a work by Bidrich Fritta. He died in 1944 uh, at Auschwitz. He was all of 38 years old at that point. And this work, which you can see is called Bunker, gives you this crowded, it looks like a jail cell. So he has somewhat uh, altered the specifics of the conditions under which individuals were being huddled together. And you see that one has clothes and one barely has none and one, you can't tell whether he's asleep or dead. And we have figures with the striped clothing that is emblematic of the conditions there and elsewhere. And even more significant is a work by him, and you can see it better because I can give you a larger image, that is called um, Movie and Reality. Now, you're probably aware of the fact that, in fact, uh, the Nazis made a propaganda film, Hitler Builds a Town for His Jews, that was essentially devoted to a coverage of Terezin at its most propagandistic and opportune best. Um, you understand that when the Red Cross would come in, suddenly there would be blankets appearing on the beds in these bunks, new coats, flowers and flower pots, if it wasn't wintertime, of course, but the, the Red Cross didn't bother to come during the wintertime, um, flowers and flower pots, benches, the whole thing was a Hollywood set. Anyone with eyes and a nose could smell the freshness of the paint the mothballs of the coats and the blankets, but the Red Cross chose not to use all of their senses. And so they took it as what it was. It was a Hollywood set. There were shops where individuals with script that was designed for terrorists and inmates could buy cups of coffee and tea and chocolate and what have you while the Red Cross was there. Behind the scenes, they're like stage flats, were the tracks and the trains on which inmates were being loaded to be sent off to Auschwitz. So here you see Fritta's rather ironic and surreal representation of what you see as, all right, we're filming this guy, you know, we've got him sitting with his cane on a bench, an old, an Altaid, you know, an old man, and we've got the makeup artist who we realized is actually Jewish and therefore no more than a piece of furniture. Well, come to think of it, the camera itself is a kind of piece of furniture because these are people as far as the Nazis are concerned, they're pieces of furniture. But in this light, you can't miss what's going on. And what we can see that's going on behind the curtain, of course, is the skeletal form, is the stone wall with the barbed wire atop it. This is what's happening out back while this is what's happening in the foreground. This is the film, this is the reality. There were artists, victims during the Holocaust who managed until they were captured to function as artists. And in this case, um, Felix Nussbaum from Germany, um, who spent time in flight here and there in Germany, in Belgium and back and around, managing to keep ahead of the Nazis for a number of years with his wife. And as you can see, he was a very fine, well-trained artist, managing somehow to paint the whole time while he was in flight from them, it's as if that was the food and the drink that kept him alive was his painting. And one observes over the course of his brief career during this period, a rather radical change from the kind of bold, I am the artist kind of representations we see earlier on to the clearly much more disturbed vision that one sees here. It's a self-portrait, but it's a self-portrait placed in the context as if he has been cornered, quite literally, presumably by some SS officer, some policeman, some somebody asking for his identity. He's showing with his collar. Yes, he is wearing the yellow star that he's required to wear. We know that he's in Belgium because the identity card that he shows them has the Flemish Jude and the French Juif to identify the bilingual nature of, of Belgium. And the look on his face is just short of a look of terror. Beyond the wall in the corner where he has been found, we see interestingly not only buildings and a rather dark sky, but we see just a bit of flowering tree, but mostly they have been chopped off as he would be 
at Auschwitz before the war was over by 1944. A very different kind of artist is Charlotte Solomon, who is a young girl. She was 18, 19, 20. She grew up in Berlin in a very, what I like to call a Christmas tree Jewish home. They celebrated Christmas, they had Christmas trees. They didn't think of themselves particularly as Jewish, except of course they knew they were, but they didn't think of themselves, they thought of themselves primarily as Germans. And things begin to change. Her personal life is, is, is traumatic because when she's nine, her mother leaps from the window and commits suicide, which it turns out an aunt also had done, which by the end of her life, her grandmother is also going to do. So she felt already as a young girl that she had a kind of burden on her shoulders of this kind of a fateful and fatal heritage. Well, one can imagine that as uh, the, the direction toward Nazism heated up, things became more and more intense for her. She began to do a series that ended up to be nearly a thousand gouaches of essentially her life story within the context of the Germany of the 30s and early 40s. And she called it, she gave it a title, Lebens oder Theater, Life or Theater, because the whole thing, and the Nazis were so enamored of theater and theatrical politics that she sometimes found herself wondering, is this real? Or is it, is it happening on a stage and I'm in the audience watching? Except alas, she wasn't just part of the audience. She was on the stage herself. So I've chosen just two images to show you. This is one, which is in the aftermath of all these wonderful uh, images of her childhood, her father married again after the, her mother's suicide, but her stepmother loved her. She had a very good relationship with her. She met this music teacher uh, at the school where she was going. Somehow she's able to stay in school longer than was ordinary for Jewish kids in Berlin at that time because of connections. But this is the beginning of the beginning of the end. This is, as you can see, the 30th of January, 1933. The Nazis are now in the march. Here is your theater in a very uh, impressive sort of manner. And Ultimately, her parents are able to send her to the south of France with, uh, to stay with her grandparents, who don't think much of her. She seems to just spend all her time doing these paintings. Doesn't she have anything to do with her life? And as I mentioned a few moments back, her grandmother is going to end up committing suicide. Her grandfather and she will end up in a concentration camp because, as you know, there was more than a substantial supply of French collaborationists, and the Vichy government in particular symptom symptomized and symbolized that. Uh, and she ultimately would, would perish. She almost, by a wealthy American woman, was able to get a visa to come to the United States. It never happened. This is not, well, it's the last image that she painted of this series. And it shows her by the seaside in the south of France. Obviously, this is before the Nazis got there. And it shows her painting. And on her back, she's written Leben oder Theater, life or theater, as the kind of some statement of what her work and her experience was all about. The question then becomes, and needless to say, there are many, many, many more artists from Terezin uh, and others like Nussbaum and like Charlotte Solomon, who managed to do art, who didn't survive, or who had done art before, who didn't survive, whose careers, like their lives, were completely truncated. That's a whole another part of that story. But the question then becomes, what happens after the war, after the Holocaust? What kind of a response might or could or should or did emerge to its events when one keeps in mind the fact that it's rare for artists not to respond to the world around them? Now, when abstract expressionism developed in the end of the 40s and the early 50s, the main art critics of the era, and the two big ones were Clement Greenberg and Harold Rosenberg, both argued that people like, and this is Jackson Pollock, one of his extraordinary canvases, had left subject matter behind completely. This is all about form. It's all about color. And I've been arguing for 30 years that, 40 years now that I think about it, that that's hardly true, that no artist can resist the world around him. And when you look at this extraordinary work, and you think about Auschwitz, and you think about Birkenau, and you think about Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and you think about a world that has exploded 
That's what he has conveyed on the canvas. That's not to deny its important formal aspects, but it's not disconnected from the world. And in fact, it's huge. And in fact, it has no frame. So for the first time in art history, consistently artists, the abstract expressionists, were placing their canvases on stretchers, but not framing them. So in a literal sense, the pigment goes around the edges and there's no separation from the outside world the way typically there would be in a very literal sense with the frame. But if Pollock is responding to all of this by reflecting the explosions on his canvas, someone like Mark Rothko, who is part of a group of New York Jewish abstract expressionists who become not actionists like Pollock, but chromaticists or color fieldists, whatever you want to call them, similarly, large canvases without frames with the pigment wrapping around the stretcher, but your eye is drawn toward the center. Your eye is resolving toward the canvas. This is not expressing the explosion as Pollock does. It's expressing a will to restore things that have exploded. It is what in Hebrew is called tikkun olam, the fixing or the repairing of the world. And it so happens that Rothko and those around him were part of a group of Jewish New York abstract expressionist artists, all of them chromaticists, who discussing in their studios, you know, where do we as Jews fit into the history of Western art, which for the last 15 centuries has been largely Christian art? How do we as Jewish artists respond? How can we not respond to an event like the Holocaust? And it turns out they were particularly interested in the late Kabbalistic group gathered in Tzfat and Safed in the Galilee around Isaac Luria in the late 1560s, early 1570s. And one of the principles that Luria emphasized was the obligation of tikkun olam, of leaving the world a better place than it was when you were born into it. So my argument for what Rothko is doing here, and again, it's not to deny the simple aesthetics of it, it's to suggest that in tandem with that, there is a social interest. Light, which ordered the universe at the beginning of Genesis, is the element that orders this canvas, connects it to us, and offers in its large scale a kind of secular messianic tikkun olam. Barnett Newman is another in that group. And Newman is the only one among them who typically gave names to his paintings, which gives us often a leg up on what we're actually supposed to be looking at. So this painting, yes, it's a painting, all white with two very thin gold zips or strips that divide it functionally into three parts and therefore create a kind of triptych is called the name two. There is no the name one, interestingly, so this is it. So he's told us what he's doing here. The triptych is a very important traditional Christian form because it reflects in symbolic language the triune nature of God as Christianity understands God. And typically in the center, you've got Jesus on his mother's lap, flanked left and right by saints, or Jesus on the cross on Golgotha, flanked left and right by the thieves. How do I, as a Jewish artist, do that sort of thing, who obviously cannot depict God the way a Christian artist can depict God? And he's given us the answer by giving us the name to tell us that that is, in fact, what he's doing, the name. Because everybody who knows anything about traditional Judaism also knows that the name for God is a circumlocution. What we say in Hebrew, Adonai, does not actually sound out the phonemes that we're reading. It's a circumlocution. And if I am a traditional Jew, I won't even say that except when I am praying, except when I'm reading from the Torah. I will instead substitute, substitute the phrase Hashem, the name. So the name is the double circumlocution for the name of God. So he's told us what this is. It's a portrait of God, as I, a Jewish artist, can depict God, which is to say a non-depiction. There's more. In the context of the Holocaust, of course, one of the prevailing questions that as it came to be discussed much later than this, really, for the most part, not until the 60s and 70s, the issue of theodicy, the justice of God, 
Was God present or absent at Auschwitz? How could God, God be present and, and all of those innocents, a million children, be fried in ovens? How could God not have been present? If God were absent, I wouldn't have survived the Holocaust. So you have two very different perspectives. God was present, God was absent. And of course, that's also what Newman has given us on his canvas. White, the absence of color, a circumlocution for the absence of God. White, the totality of color. White, the symbol of light, the symbol of God, the symbol of God's totality. So God is circumlocutionarily both absent and present on this canvas. So my argument is that Newman and Rothko and Gottlieb in one way, seeking a kind of tikkun olam, and artists like Pollock in another way, simply reflecting the chaos on their canvases, as much as they are about aesthetics, are all about commenting on these events. In Israel, the Holocaust is a subject that has only arrived at slowly and painfully other than in a kind of dismissive manner, in part because of the sense of wanting to distinguish what we Israelis are becoming. I'm talking from 1947 through the early 60s, through the time of Eichmann's trial in 1961-62, what we are becoming as opposed to what diaspora Jews were for which the Holocaust ultimately becomes the most negative of symbols. But among the artists there who eventuates as the head of the Betzalel school in Jerusalem, Mordechai Ardon, who had arrived at the end of the 20s to what was then called Palestine and not overly comfortable with it and then became extremely comfortable and then primarily in his paintings painted elements that referred to Eretz Yisrael, its present, its multiple layered pasts. It's 1958 before he suddenly, and it is rather sudden, turns emphatically to include among his subjects, subjects that reflect on the Holocaust. So I'm showing you here a painting from that year. Actually, I'm showing you the center part of a triptych. Again, that triptych form, a reflection on that traditional form within Western Christian art. The triptych is called Misa Dura, harsh mass, as in the Catholic mass. And the centerpiece that I'm showing you is called Kristallnacht. So it's a direct reflection of that turning point in the night of November 9th, 10th, 1938, when throughout Germany, Jewish synagogues were burned, Jewish stores and houses were destroyed, Jews were murdered and or injured in significant numbers. And a turning point because ironically, after that moment, for reasons beyond this discussion, it was safer for a Jew on the streets of Munich or Berlin than it had been before. But on the other hand, the Nazis were rethinking the process of a more systematic, cleaner exterminationist policy vis-a-vis -vis the Jews. So Kristallnacht, as Ardon revisions it, is chaos. It's flotsam and jetsam, it's torn Torah scrolls, it's nine kingpins, as in the nine elements of the Hanukkah menorah, Hanukkah meaning dedication, rededication, being thrown cattywampus, a repeating use of three empty spaces to suggest the emptiness of the triune God of love who was nowhere in evidence during the night of Kristallnacht, and faces that come and go as two-dimensional, and a horizon line that you can, that barely enables you to distinguish the, the chaotic skies from the chaotic earth below. And for my money, most interestingly, of course, what you see here, that you may recognize as the hand of God and the hand of Adam from the Sistine Chapel that Michelangelo had done back in 1508, 9, 10, thereabouts. But of course, the hands have been cut off. They're deracinated, they're disconnected from God and from Adam and they're no longer in color, they're just pale black and white. And they're caught up in a series of strings, almost as if they are puppeteer strings, but themselves controlled from beyond the canvas and controlling what ultimately, if that's what they are, nothing but chaos. So it's a multiply layered, figurative and semi-abstract reflection on the horrors of Kristallnacht as a kind of prelude to what will become so much more profound as time moves on. Now, the question becomes, what about artists who were survivors and became artists or continued to be artists in the aftermath of the Holocaust? 
how might or could or did they respond to the situation through which they had lived. Fritz Asher, whose name uh, belongs to the Fritz Asher Society, of which Rachel is the director, as you know. Um, Fritz Asher was a very successful and very interesting, very dynamic expressionist artist in the period when he first came into focus, let's say around 1915 or so. He was born in 1893. So I'm saying, you know, in his early 20s, when um, he became involved with all kinds of artists and poets and what have you, and did a whole range of very interesting paintings, one of the single features of which is that they tend to be figures, faces, people, people, people. And another element of which is their intensity, their expressionist kind of intensity. Well, Asher is able to hide for two and a half years in Berlin, in the Grunewald, in the area that had become the heart of where the Nazi brass had taken up its residence, having confiscated the beautiful houses there for most of their inhabitants, many of whom had been Jews. He was hiding for the most part in the basement of a friend of his mother's who cared for him, who kept him. He and the rats and the potatoes and the sacks. During the time that he was in hiding, of course, he had no access to painting materials. So he shifted genres from painting, he became a poet, and his poetry is tent, dense, intense, and fascinating, and reflective on a whole range of subjects, from the music that he loved, in particular Beethoven, to nature, to his experience. He survives. He goes back to painting, and he lives until 1970. But the interesting thing about Asher's post-Holocaust painting is if on the one hand, it has become even more intensely expressionistic. And if you look at this painting of a sunset, you also get uh, an almost uh, impressionist, uh, expressionist quality to it. But this is not alone in being the kind of subject matter to which he turned in the last 25 years of his painting life. There is the occasional figure but for the most part, he turns to nature. His paintings are of landscapes, of trees that, that function kind of as stand-in for people, of moments like this, as if the experience had marked him most obviously in the work that he now came to produce by causing him to lose the interest and the faith and the hope that he had had in human beings before. Whereas where nature is concerned, he still has that, and he can still work with that kind of subject matter. So Asher is unusual, as I'll say, as I'll repeat in a second, because of the fact that barely is the war and the barely is the Holocaust over, and he's got access to materials, and he starts painting again. Other painters fall into a kind of different direction. Alice Luck Kahana who at the age of 14 was pulled from her community of Sharvar, not far from Budapest, she and her entire family, except her father. He was off on a business trip to Budapest that day, so he wasn't part of the roundup. She worked her way and survived through three different camps during that last year as a 14, 15-year-old. Everyone else in the family perished. Most significantly, her beloved older sister, with whom she managed to hook up, and they managed to survive together, and the liberation came, and they were both sick, and they were separated and sent to separate facilities. She never saw a sister again. She never knew what happened to her. She didn't know whether she'd perished. There was no record in the hospital to which she'd been taken. She describes crawling up the steps, because she herself was still so weak, of that hospital to find out what had happened to Edith. Alice had sworn when she was in the camps that someday she'd become an artist and somehow she'd paint rainbows instead of ashes. And to make her very interesting story short, she ended up by way of marrying an Israeli husband together with him in Houston where he was a rabbi and where she became a painter, took art classes, 
and was very interested in the color field artists, the next generation after Rothko and, and, and Newman, like Morris Lewis in particular. But in 1978, she visited Sharvar for the first time, do the math, in 33, well, 34 years since she left it for Auschwitz and the camps, and was shocked to find no memory of the Jews, no memory of her family, of her mother who was active in the community, of course, people living in her house. And so she set out, her painting completely changed thereafter, to create works that would reflect on and memorialize her community and the larger community that had been destroyed across Europe by the Nazis and produced a body of work that was entitled in some Rainbows from the Ashes. So this is one such example. And it's a painting, as a matter of fact, that ended up gifted to the uh, collections of modern contemporary art of the Vatican Museums. And it was presented to Pope Benedict XVI at the time and you can see that what is clearly a rain, uh, train tracks leading not to the iconic tower of Auschwitz, but instead that tower has just become a black empty space. It's a black hole. All the light has escaped from it. And across the landscape, whether it is the earth or beyond the horizon, across the sky, the repeated numbers, letters, numbers, letters that of course <clears throat> come from the tattoo on her own arm. And then there's this miasmic kind of cloud. What could that be? And Pope Benedict asked her, what is that? And she said, every morning I wake up, I have the smell of the ovens in my nostrils. I can't get it out. How do you paint a smell? That's what she's got here. And in the second work, which storyline-wise, at first glance seems more benign, but at second glance, none of them is benign. As you can see as a diptych, you can see what she frequently does in terms of her materials. So it's torn paper on canvas and burned paper on canvas, and it's charcoal, and it's paint, and it's pencil, and it's pen, and it's ash, and it's dirt, and it's grit, and it's sand, the textures of these you can't, of course, imagine from the screen. But you can certainly recognize what is a barely blotted out Arbeit macht frei, work makes, one's free, what makes one free, that cynical statement written by the Nazis on the archway over the entrance into Auschwitz. And all of these verticals, 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 like a combination of a never ending systematic rainfall that at the same time has the appearance of bars so that this becomes a kind of gate that is barred. But then you notice a number of other things around and the one that I, my eye is drawn to is where the horizontal bars come along. And then I realize those aren't just horizontal bars, that's a musical stave because look, there are musical notes here and musical notes there. And then I remember, Teretzin wasn't the only place where music was performed with the utmost of cynicism that makes these words almost seem benign by comparison, the Nazis had a Jewish orchestra playing right on the way to the gas chamber. So you would, on your march to the gas chamber, be accompanied by nice music that would entertain and calm you. Music calms the savage beast. By the way, the musicians themselves, probably the next week would end up where you were on the line and there would be other musicians. So the cynicism of the process is what is reflected. And take note in both those paintings, but this one, since we're on it, the pieces of red and the pieces of blue, the elements of the rainbow that somehow shine through these ashes. Kitty Kleidman, who is about five or six years younger than Alice and came from Slovakia, not from, from Hungary, was three when she and her older brother who was five and her parents were rescued her father's business partner, who had to take over the business because everything was Aryanized, made arrangements for them to take refuge with a farm couple that was willing to hide them for the last year and a half or so of the war. And so they walked to the farm and they made their way into uh, the space essentially between the roof and the attic. That's the space which was theirs by day, at night, they could open up the trap door and look down below. 
And Kitty, like Alice, for the first X number of years after the Holocaust, as she became an artist and lived in Israel and lived in Spain and eventually came to the United States, married to an American husband here in the Washington DC area, had two kids as Alice had three kids and so on, didn't really think much about her experience, at least on the canvas. In 1989, so 44 years after, she with her family went back to seek out the children of the couple who had hidden them and, and saved them. And when she came back for the next five years, all she could paint was what she talked about the series uh, as hidden memories. And this is just one of them. Without the backstory, it's almost a kind of abstraction, you know, with, with uh, verticals and horizontals and diagonals and light pouring in and light pouring out and darks and lights and so on and so forth, negative and positive space. With the backstory, you understand that this is the crawl space in which they were living for a year and a half or so. There happened to be a skylight, or maybe there wasn't. Maybe she is placed out there. Certainly the back wall would not have been all bright and light. She has revisioned that reality in a way that is benign. The painting is palliative for her. It's not an expression of anger. Sam, Samuel Bach, who is from Vilnius, Lithuania, uh, he was born in 1933, therefore, he was six when the war began in 1939. Six, the sixth commandment, thou shalt commit, not commit murder. Six becomes an obsessive number for him. It appears again and again in his paintings, which are like this one, these uh, rather naturalistically surreal and surreal naturalistic kind of images where stone appears as flesh and flesh appears as wood and wood appears as stone. And in this case, as you can see, it's called Identity One. It's part of a series. It's actually a self-portrait. He himself survived because his father had permission to go outside the ghetto to gather wood and he carried young Samuel in the, 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 the pack on his back out. And he survived, his father ended up killed, his mother survived. They were in Israel, they were in Paris, they were in Israel, he was in New York, he was in Israel, he now lives in Western Massachusetts. And a number of his works are like this one, self-portraits. You can see the eyes, you can see the hands bleeding and you recognize those as the stigmata, as in Christ's wounds. You can see the six pointed star in yellow that forms part of the backdrop as he grows as it were right out of the rubble of the sidewalk itself. Two things inspire this image. One is this, you probably recognize that. It's that famous photograph of a child uh, at the Warsaw Ghetto Roundup, and you can see the Nazi soldier kind of calmly perusing him and the terror on his face. And this image again and again and again becomes the self-portrait of Sam Bach. So here's a second version of the identity. Again, the ha in this case, the rocky hat is a little more crumpled. In this case, the holes are in the hands, uh, but without the blood. So variations on a theme, but again and again, reflections of his experience that he's translated into reflections on certain images that are endemic and significant for Western Christian art that reflect its nature as Christian art and its relationship to what Christianity has been about historically. And that question, not of theodicy, where was God? But where were those who prayed to a God of love when this kind of behavior is being meted out against people? They're not only survivors, but their children or their nieces, their nephews, their family members. Sherry Carver, who lives out on the West Coast, in the 90s did this whole series that relates to the experience ultimately of her father who managed to make it across Siberia and escape and her uncle who didn't. That is, he survived, but he was, ended up in a camp. And this is one from that series. And she's taken literally that idea that a painting is a kind of window through which you look into space, except the space into which she looks is not articulated by that three-dimensionality that is uh, discussed by Alberti in his treatise on painting of 1435. It's time that one sees when one looks through that window. So there is a window within the window and the farther part of the window, you can probably recognize those are railroad tracks. 
she grew up in Chicago. So railroad tracks are kind of a personal symbol of Chicago's railroad tracks. But at the same time, in the context of a Holocaust painting, it's part of that iconic language of what symbolizes events. And the window within the window is the image of a figure who it turns out is her uncle. The painting is called Souvenir. Souvenir is, you know, it's that little tchotchke you bring back from your vacation and put on your mantelpiece. But of course, it comes from the French word souvenir, which means memory. It's what I remember. And we see this figure devised of this, this stuff is, is clay, ceramic work that she's fired and then smashed with her father's ceramic hammer and then put back together as this kind of elaborate mosaic. So she's putting things back together, literally. And they have gravitas, they have weight, literally. It's not just paint, it's painted ceramic work. So in fact, this frame is necessary in its solidity to hold the whole thing together. So her uncle, he's got this shirt, which clearly enough from the look on his eyes, we might suppose has provoked a souvenir, a memory, the stripes clearly relating to his experience because oddly he's wearing a suit, but the, 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 um, the arm of the, of the jacket is rolled up and you may not be able to see, but when you see the work in person, you can tell that he's got the um, tattoo on his arm that the Nazis left for him. That's the souvenir. That's the souvenir. That's the souvenir. It's all a souvenir and it's all memory. But then of course there are artists, particularly Jewish artists. So it brings us full circle back to Newman and Rothko, but we fast forward to the 18, 1980s and the 1990s by which time the subject matter of the Holocaust had become fairly widespread and a focus and interest by Jewish artists in particular. You have Marty Kalb, who was a professor at um, a university in Ohio, who done an endless series of these kind of photorealist, there are charcoal drawings based on photographs that he's taken. So this is an oven at Majdanek. If you didn't have the title, you might not be sure what it is, although you might wonder when you look closely and realize those are skulls, aren't they? So he's given us a rather literal and gruesome souvenir, as it were, of the Holocaust from the perspective of someone whose anger, and I, I, I knew Marty fairly well, and there was loads of it, particularly when the subject of the Holocaust came up. So if I looked, for example, at the work of Alice LaCahana or Kitty Clydman as being palliative, his work is not palliative, it's expressive of anger. And you could say perhaps the same of the series of 33 works done by uh, Maurizio Lasansky, an Argentinian born uh, artist who ended up coming to the United States. He was particularly renowned with respect to graphics and he created the printmaking department at the uh, University of Iowa. Uh, well, that's where he spent his last 30 or 40 years. He died at the age of 98 in 2012. He did 33 works that are called the Nazi drawings. And you can see just one of them, the kind of tonality that he offers, this victim tied up by its ankles, hanging, its arms pulled down. And in this case, it's hanging from what is rather obviously a cross. So it's not just what the Nazis were doing to their victims that he is presenting, but he's presenting the question of how and who collaborated with them, not just by way of individuals, but by way of institutions. And in particular, of course, he has in mind the church. And given the fact that he's from Argentina, which is the country above all, to which Nazis came because they were granted refuge there, and they got there by way of an underground railroad provided by the church. So in Argentina, in Buenos Aires, you have two large populations of former Nazi Germans and former German Jews, an interesting kind of mix. So it isn't surprising that this would be the view he would take. Which leads me to one last image by a German non-Jew, Anselm Kiefer. Because if there is one other population that has come to feel the need to respond to the Holocaust besides Jews and Jewish artists, it's non-Jewish German and Austrian artists because those are the heartlands of the Holocaust. And Kiefer, who is one of what in German is called the Nachgeborn, the afterborn, because for him in Germany, 
the war divides history before and after as it does for Jews. So he's born in 1945, actually about two months before the end of the war in the basement of a hospital where his mother pregnant was placed because of allied bombings to protect them. And he grew up in a Germany that evinced absolutely no awareness of the Holocaust. If he would hear something here or there and, and bring it up, it was like, what are you talking about? Nah, nothing like that happened. And by the 1960s, thanks to the Eichmann trial in Jerusalem, no one could any longer deny anything about what had been going on. And his art, which became very political, eventuated among other directions with an obsession with Jewish mysticism and focusing on Jewish mystical subjects in the context of the Holocaust. So this very, very large work, which is found here at the National Gallery of Art in Washington is called Tzim Tzum. You can see he's written it across the top. If you're not German speakers and you don't know that the Z in German has a Tz sound, so it's not Tzim Tzum, it's Tzim Tzum. And Tzim Tzum in Lurianic Kabbalah is the term, it means contraction that he uses to answer the following question. How did God create the universe? Traditional Kabbalah says, God kind of emanated itself, spread out from a singularity to an, a multifariousness. Luria said, no, it's the opposite. How is there room for the universe? God contracted itself into an absolutely infinitesimal singularity to make room for the universe. In this context, of course, all of these lines going towards a kind of center at a horizon point resonate from that treatise of Alberti that I mentioned from 1435, in which he describes how you give the illusion of looking on a flat surface into three-dimensional space. You create these orthogonals that end in what he calls the vanishing point. And so we see this vanishing point here, and yet we don't really have the illusion that we're looking into three-dimensional volumetric space, do we? because it's punning on yet another vanishing point. The vanishing point is, I grew up in a Germany where anytime anything was bad, someone would say, oh, it's the Jews, but there were never any Jews around because they had vanished. And as he came to learn about the Holocaust, he understood. And so these become, as it were, the tracks to that tower, which is Auschwitz. It's the vanishing point. Before you get there, another kind of open space, a kind of black hole, the whole thing made of lead and ash and pigment and other kinds of elements. So again, it's very textural. And Simsum is the title, God's contraction, the question of the vanishing of God, allied to the question of the vanishing of the Jews, allied to the art historical question of creating image by use of the vanishing point is part of the amalgam of what he's got in mind here, not as a solution to the problem, but as an expression of his recognition of um, how serious the problem of the Holocaust remains for the country in which he grew up that at the time evinced no awareness of it. So this is the tip of the iceberg. There are obviously many, many, many more artists and images, both from before and during and after that one could look at um, to consider this question of what Holocaust art is all about. But this is where I'll stop. Thank you so much, Ori. That was uh, uh, super interesting, as we can see in the comments also. Um, two, two things before we have to conclude. David Stern actually uh, thanks you for an excellent and inspiring lecture and has one comment about the Newman painting called Two. Um, to underscore your interpretation, um, two is, of course, also the numerical value of the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet, which is not incidentally the first letter of the Torah. So Correct. Um, that's another layer. Point but, very well taken. Accepted. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, David. And then I have a question from Elizabeth Berkowitz. Um, one uh oh who <laughs> says, wonderful as always, Ori. One thing that has always interested me with your reading of Rothko and Newman has been the degree to which it's, uh, it sets up a, di a, a dichotomy of American Jewish art world a coping post-Shoah. 
Greenberg and Rosenberg's rivalry, criticism, professional networks, and personal lives were intertwined with interwar to post-war Jewish experience, however much this facet is often dismissed. Their formalism could be read as partly a combination of assimil uh, assimilationist and avoidant responses to the Shoah, formalism's uh, false neutrality, a coping strategy in opposition to your Tikkun Olam reading of Rothko and Newman. What do you say to this? A, a hundred percent. Elizabeth, you could not be more correct. Um, they are, they're, they're running from it. Um, and the, it, just as you said, avoidance and denial and all of that. And um, I organized an exhibition in 1999 called Jewish Artists Colon on the Edge. And there was an artist, I won't say who it was, quite well known, actually a photographer whom I wanted to join the, the, uh, the, um, the exhibition. And um, he said, I can't. And I said, why not? He said, well, the word Jewish. This is an artist who had a, a major gallery in New York and in Paris. But when his Paris gallery offered a photograph to the Israel Museum, and it was a photograph from a San Francisco series, not a Holocaust series, not a Jewish series. The curator at the Israel Museum at the time said, no, he's too Jewish. My point, as you will no doubt recognize, is that even then, and I suppose even now, there may be some Jewish artists who are uncomfortable with, because the art world is still not fully comfortable with the concept of asking even what Jewish art is. Uh, as opposed to making certain assumptions about it. And as you know, Clement Greenberg, uh, or rather Harold Rosenberg gave a, a well-known talk in which he said, well, there's no such thing as Jewish art because the narrowness of his definition, of course, made it possible for him to say that. Um, so yes, not to be overly long-winded, you couldn't be more right. You couldn't be more right about what you said. Right. Susan Schender, um says a fascinating theory about Jewish expressionists and Isaac Luria. Did Rothko or the others write about the influence of Kabbalah? Newman wrote a little about it and um, he's the only one and not that much. Uh, here's my sad story. About 25 years ago, I was giving a lecture and I, and I made this comment and this, uh, this old guy comes up to me after the lecture and he says, you know, I used to to be in their studios and I used to be sitting in and I'm thinking, uh-oh, he's gonna say, you're completely wrong. He said, you're completely right. They were talking about this stuff, specifically about Luria all the time, it obsessed them. Alas, I didn't get his name, so I can't you know, prove to you, but Newman writes a li very little bit about it, a little bit, but that's it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And she asked another question, whether adult art from Terezin was also buried and found later. Or whether, whether, I'm sorry, what art? Uh, art by adults, not only oh, children. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, yes. I mean, that's why we, we have a fair amount. And, and, you know, they were doing drawings on, on, on matchbook covers. I mean, whatever they had available, because clearly the imperative to record was essential to them. So yes, we do, yes, we do. Yeah, exactly. And um, I think there are still actually uh, art, um, artworks and documents being found. Uh, yeah, yeah. That, I mean, stuff would, uh, let me give you a, a, an oblique example. Victor Ullmann, the composer, left his stuff with a friend and we don't know how it survived except it was discovered in the 80s in uh, an attic in London. So however that friend apparently did or didn't survive and it, it ended up in London, his, his manuscripts. So as late Rachel says, stuff is turning up, not only there obviously, but in odd places. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, I think uh, we're about There was one last question, just it's Alice. It was a question of identity. Alice Lock Kahana, C-A-H-A-N-A, -A -A, Kahana. Is and, and and it's Edith, not Eden, although her granddaughter's middle name is Eden. <laughs> or Edith. Perfect. <laughs> uh, yes. Okay. Thank you so much, Ori. This was uh, fascinating. Um, I want to conclude this event with a quote from Elie Wiesel, who once said, and I quote.
For the dead and the living, we must bear witness, for not only are we responsible for the memories of the dead, we are also responsible for what we are doing with those memories." Um, end quote. Please stay, stay healthy, everyone, and well, and stay in touch. Goodbye. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.